coming up, little spot of Q&A from you, sucked straight from your mind by super-secret CIA spy satellites. The exact kind of orbiting devices being launched today by the world's biggest bullshitter, Elon Electric Jesus Musk. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where discerning sons of convicts in an untamed land at the arse end of the earth where everything kills you, Australia, save thousands of their next new cars. Everything does kill you, you know. Down under, even the boobies, because even they are untamed. Not yet domesticated. up on the website for that. What were we talking about again? <laughs> ah yes, questions from you. Hi, what kind of car would you go for out of Tucson High Rider? I think he means Highlander. 2017 with 4,000 Ks or Range Rover Evoque 2013 with 45,000 Ks, both around 40 grand. Thanks. It's got to be the Tucson every time, doesn't it? Or a CX-5 or a Forester. A Sportage, come on, I mean, Land Rover is an unequivocal disaster. Once again, it's a case of beautiful cars that drive okay, but they always let you down on quality and reliability. And frankly, the green oval is everything we've come to love about Volkswagen, minus the outright criminal conspiracy. So there's that. I mean, they've turned this into an art form, haven't they? Poor reliability and letting customers down in the dealership and then at the Australian importer level. These clowns are famous for it. So buy a Land Rover at your own risk. My wife has just come home and found that the radio on our 2011 Mazda 3 Neo is not turning off even when the ignition is completely off. I would like to hit Mazda up for this. Do you think this should be covered under the Consumer Law Act? I am asking as I really do not want to go into my local dealer and looking like an ass. Do you think I am being unreasonable in wanting this fixed given the age of the car? Well, it's an eight year old car with a comparatively minor auto electrical defect, I'd suggest. So I don't really think this is what consumer law is designed for. And if you take it that far, Mazda could easily win if push comes to shove, simply on the premise that a fault such as this is kind of normal in a car of that age. You could take it to the dealer and ask nicely, of course. Diplomacy works wonders at times, and they might fix it for free or meet you halfway, who knows? But you'll probably pay over the odds for the repair if they decline to compromise in any way with you. So that's a two-edged sword there. I'd want to be able to back out if they say, no, mate, full price. I'd rather go to an independent repairer for that because I know that would be cheaper. You know, some cars have the circuitry built in where the radio system remains on after shutdown so you can pump up the fat beats while waiting for... I don't know, back up. And the uh, auto off trigger is when you open the door. So that switch, you know, the door open switch is involved in some way. So it might be as simple as a faulty door open switch or some kind of simple glitch like a short circuit. What I'd do before you do anything else is I'd try opening the passenger's door with everything shut down and see if that shuts the audio off or you could pull the fuse and reinstall it I guess in case it's a software glitch that might invoke some kind of deeper reboot, who knows. You could cycle the remote lock and unlock function as well to see if that has any effect on the defect and if all of that doesn't work I'd really just trot off down to the local auto electrician and get them to fix it and of course you'll have to pay pay for it, but hey, it's a reasonably old car now and that's what they do. I noticed that in your lemon list, Toyota was not mentioned, knowing already that they are a great vehicle. What surprised my even more is that they didn't make you best car list. 
What I did notice in the best car list was a repetitive approach to Kia, Hyundai and Mazda. Can you explain to me why Toyota has missed out? A couple of things about Toyota, okay? Number one, and there's no argument on this, they lead the market. They are the king commercially, so that's good for them. They've got an entrant in every segment and they have been so spectacularly successful marketing themselves. They've done legendary reliability campaigns and they've had, oh, what a feeling since the cows came home virtually. And they've been good at that and it's paying off for them. They're reaping the benefit now, good on them. Number two though, they are the king of friggin' mediocrity. In most segments, you'd have to say, and they do some things very well, but in general, they fail to excite. And I'd have to say that even where they do very well, like let's look at the 200 series Land Cruiser, you'd hardly say that was some paragon of fantastic value, would you? I mean, look at the price, come on. It's robust and it's good at outback touring. It's a great heavy tow vehicle. It's all of those things, but it's just not particularly good value. And when you look at something like Hilux Rugged X, put the biggest trailer you can on the back of a Hilux Rugged X and see how much load you can't carry in your unbreakable Hilux. Like, come on. And many of these other segments, right? You've got your Kluger, you've got your Camry, you've got your Corolla. These cars are fundamentally good cars. And the one thing missing from them, apart from Android Auto and Apple CarPlay, is excitement. They just fail to excite. They, they just don't have that secret source. They've got the secret source for reliability and robustness and you know they do reasonably good service and they've amped up to a five-year warranty recently here in Chittsville so that's all great. But on balance you'd have to say this is a pretty good way not to be on the lemon list and also not to be on the best cars list because they're not lemons but they're hardly the best cars in any segment. Is the Hyundai i30 Fastback N really as good as the hype? Yes. Really? Seriously? Yes. This is one of my favourite accessible performance cars, mainly because of the three Fs, right? It's fast, fun and affordable. And that E-diff up the pointy end, OMFG, on the way out of a band, it's pretty freaking Jedi. You need to experience that to believe it. And the fastback is dead sexy. Admit it. More than a little CLA Mercedes-Benz coupe at the rear too, don't you think? Only not gay like the Benz. And this, this, ladies and gentlemen, the automated rev matching in this car is, it's brilliant. It's literally superhuman as in, better at matching revs than a human. So there's that. I'm gonna seriously detest giving this car back, okay? And that's something of an acid test. I don't say that very often. But if you wanted to take the next step, you'd probably be looking at something like a BMW M140i. That's gonna cost you 50% more cash. It's gonna be rear wheel drive if you're into that kind of thing. And it will certainly be objectively faster but I'm not sure it'd be quite as much fun as the i30N because there's so much fun technology built in to that car. It really is the vehicle you buy to impress the crap out of yourself every time you have a punt on a favorite piece of twisty road. And the warranty even covers you for track days. Question about the Land Cruiser 200 GXL relating to the curb weight or ATM. Does the curb weight specified by Toyota include the 139 litres of diesel with a weight of about 130 kilos? Or is the fuel capacity included in the 650 kilo payload? So I'd suggest it's always a nice idea to ask the manufacturer in these situations because they do a whole bunch of apparently kooky things in the background and it's always those unknown unknowns that are going to get you when you guess at this stuff. But here's the way I see it off the bat, okay? For that Land Cruiser, the tear weight 
is 26.30 kilos, okay, 2.63 tonnes, and the curb weight is 27.40. So that makes pretty good sense. There's 110 kilos worth of difference, and the tear weight includes 10 litres of fuel. The fuel tank in that car is 138 litres, so we're going to add 128 litres to the tear weight to get the curb weight, because the curb weight versus the tear weight is really just full tank of fuel versus 10 litres of fuel in the car. So that's pretty simple. Diesel is 830 grams per litre, so that's 128 litres times 0.83 kilos per litre is about uh, 107 kilograms and then 2630 plus 107 is 2737 versus 2740. So there you go. I mean, that's just a roundup error, right? They've obviously just rounded it up to the nearest 10 kilos, I guess. That's a pretty simple explanation. So it seems to me, yeah, the curb weight of the cruiser does include the industry standard agreed upon definition of full fuel tank and the mass of the fuel checks out. So all good. I'm intrigued why certain brands cop such a hammering. In particular, my other half loves the look of the Volkswagen Polo. She's recently taken it for a drive and, and enjoyed it. I look around the roads and I see a lot of people driving Golfs and Polos, so I'm lost as to what's wrong with them. Are they mechanically inferior or just too expensive or what? would appreciate your response so that we can be better informed as to what is the ideal car for her. Okay, so free country and all of that, you are allowed to love whatever, certainly allowed to love the look of Volkswagen because they are beautiful cars and they drive really well. But I'd suggest that if you buy a car as if it's some freaking handbag, you are potentially at least opening a wormhole to the dimension of extreme disappointment. There's really only three things wrong with Volkswagen, okay? Number one, the company is ethically unbalanced and morally bankrupt, clearly. And that's such a dignified way of describing the process of assholification that they imposed upon themselves, you know, that fast track. In case you've been dead from the neck up, right, Volkswagen is guilty of a major criminal conspiracy which prioritised profit above human health and it's in the process of killing thousands of people prematurely, according to numerous credible independent academic experts. So there's that. They're currently being sued for millions by the ACCC here in the trailer of arse. And secondly, the vehicles are very poor when it comes to reliability. And I know what you're going to say. Well, I've had three Golfs and they were great. I'd suggest that one, two or three vehicles is not what I would describe as a solid metadata analysis. The reliability is shit compared with market average. That's just how it is. And they used to be quite okay, Volkswagen, on reliability, but quality took a real hit there when they launched that insane plot to dominate the world just a few years ago. Something had to give in the product inventory and the R&D cycling, and it was reliability, right? Number three, the only thing they're worse at than reliability is customer support. And this is the double whammy from hell. They're properly evil mother lovers when it comes to that. So you've just got to think, I might go to Guantanamo Bay for my holiday instead. Roughly equivalent experiences, that customer care department. My inbox fills up with Volkswagen customers at their freaking wits end because they got nothing to go back with. They're just, it's like punching, I don't know, it's like when you punch a punching bag, it always wins. The bag always wins. This is what a dispute with Volkswagen is like. They just, they give you nothing back in the customer care department. But apart from that, okay, buying a Volkswagen is a great idea. They're really nice looking cars and in general, they drive really well too. Unfortunately, on my world, there's just more to owning a car than that. And I'd rather see you spend your money on expensive cocaine and cheap, uh, let's call them cheerleaders. Buy a Mazda 2, right? Otherwise, it's just Russian roulette. Mercedes X-Class 350D. We have already brought the car, had 1,600 Ks on the clock, 
Am I still able to salary sacrifice? My wife does her car. I think I saw that movie. My wife does her car. Quite uplifting if memory serves. Novated leasing in just a second, okay? But I thought I'd take just a few moments to detain you and let you know what's coming up on the channel over the next seven to 10 days. You've probably noticed this rather large red object in the background. One of my favorite performance cars, the i30 Fastback N. Full review on this car coming up in the next week or so. Plus, because this car's got a really nice innovation, an e-diff, electronically controlled, meaning computer controlled, limited slip front differential. If you just went, what the? <laughs> then I'm gonna demystify that in a beer garden physics package devoted exactly to e-diffs. What are they? What do they do? Do you need one? What's the benefit? That's coming up as well. And just for completeness, because we're talking about cornering and vehicle dynamics control in that package, I thought I might also detain you briefly over the next week or so and talk about electronic stability control, also called the electronic stability program. Statistically, every average to brand new car on Australian roads has ESC, but I don't know how many people know exactly what it does, what the benefit is, and whether or not it'll intervene in particular situations and help protect you. So if you've always wondered about electronic stability control but have been too afraid to ask, that's coming up over the next week or so as well. And if you'd like to be notified of those uploads when they occur, it's a simple two-step process. Just subscribe to the channel now, hit the subscribe button, and then hit the bell notification icon, and then you'll get those desktop notifications. Now, Novated Leasing, okay? Such a minefield, but not a bad way to own a car if it's right for you. This is a particular structure of financial ownership instrument, okay? And what necessarily happens here is that the leasing company must own the vehicle and they lease it to you. That's the way the paperwork works anyway. In practice, it's your car, of course, but on paper, it's their car, they're leasing it to you, you have a lease agreement. And this allows a couple of things. Number one, big advantage here is that you don't pay the GST on a new car. And this is one of the few ways that a salaried employee in Australia can avoid paying the GST on a brand new car. And this is because the leasing company purchases the car, they lease it to you, they've paid the GST on the car, but they get to claim the GST back from the tax office as an input tax credit because it's a direct cost of doing business. Fantastic news for you, you get the car GST free. However, in this particular case, you already own the car, you've paid the GST on it, so these two things make it very difficult indeed to get a novated lease happening after the fact. To do that, the way I read it, you'd have to sell that car to the leasing company and they'd have to lease it back to you. You've already paid the GST on the purchase and there's no way you're getting that back. So there's advantage number one just written off. You're not gonna get that advantage. And the other problem of selling it back to the leasing company is that it's not worth the same now as when you bought it. I know it's still a fairly new car, but it is a used car and that's the way the leasing company is gonna look at it. So they're not gonna to wanna to buy it for the full new car price, so there's that. And the other problem is if you've got finance on the current car, you'll have to pay that off. And you certainly weren't thinking about paying it off early when you took out the finance, I'm sure. And there is probably an early payout penalty clause on that finance. So that's big, big cross number, whatever it is, three or something for changing your ownership structure to novated leasing after the fact. So what I'd suggest you do is just shelve that proposal for the time being until you buy your next new car. And then if Novated Leasing makes sense, go for it then. And by that, I mean go and see your accountant and ask them after considering the granular totality of your financial situation, whether or not Novated Leasing is right for you. And if it is, then decide on the car and then go and talk to the Novated Lease provider. If you're locked into a particular provider with your employer, then that that's a certainty, you've got to deal with them. Otherwise, just shop around. But even if you are locked in, you've got to go and shop for the car independently as well, just to make sure that you are 
being offered a reasonable deal by that one leasing provider with whom you might be locked in. But in this situation, you've already owned the car, that ship has absolutely sailed. I'd say, let's just forget about Novated Leasing for the time being. Traded a four-wheel drive ute on a new four-wheel drive through Private Fleet. A price was agreed on and I gave them credit card details for a $2,000 deposit. My local dealer has since given me a better deal. Can I renege on the deal with Private Fleet and get my deposit back? This was done over the phone seven days ago. They say that's how it's done over the phone and won't refund my deposit. So up front from Disclaimerville, I'm not a lawyer, this is not legal advice, but in general, when you pay a deposit, you've kind of, at least in some de facto way on my world, you've entered into a contract to buy something, in this case a car obviously, at an agreed price. And the deposit is generally subject to forfeiture, meaning you're gonna lose it if you decide not to complete on that contract. And again, not a lawyer, but the fact that you paid a deposit seems to me like a pretty strong indicator that you did agree with them, you know, you entered into a contract verbally to proceed. And your message indicates this as well. They've probably done some legwork and gone some way down the track with the dealer procuring that vehicle on your behalf, they've ordered it, whatever. So it seems to me very unreasonable of you now for you to back out and expect the deposit to be refunded. If you'd had some personal disaster that you couldn't have foreseen, like a death in the family or a major health issue, as if death's not a major health issue, a bank cancelling your credit or foreclosing on the mortgage, God knows what, any of those disasters that you hear about that people incur from time to time, I guess that would be a different story and you could plead hardship and hope that they would be reasonable about that. But if you just get a better offer, I don't think so. Perhaps you could ask for special dispensation if there were special circumstances, but you certainly haven't mentioned them here. But this business about getting a better offer, all right, that happens all the time. And I see people negotiating backwards and forwards. There's a $50,000 car on the table and they're talking about, well, he'll get it for me for 200 bucks less. It's not worth talking about. There's a point at which the price is for practical intents and purposes identical I'd suggest and it's not even worth your time to go down this track. So in this case time to wear the big boy's pants I think. So if the offer is five grand better you could always kiss the deposit goodbye and embrace the concept of being a net three thousand bucks in front. If it's just a thousand bucks better or something it's one of those chump change situations. Forget about it, it's unimportant, move on with your life and proceed uh, with your agreement that you'd already entered into. For this reason, it's an excellent idea, always to do it this way, right? Shop first, agree on the deal second, and pay a deposit third, but only when you are absolutely certain. And at that point, just stop shopping and haggling and all that stuff. Another dealer rings you up and says, got a better offer, just say, sorry, I've already placed a deposit with a preferred provider. So I think, in summary, your deposit is toast.